Hey everyone, this is uh, um, an amazing day today, and I'll walk you through it. I need y'all's prayer. It's something that uh, I don't get to encounter. I must, it, it, yeah, very rarely get to encounter this, but um, I'll, I'll share my heart with you in a, in a moment on it. But but I want to also give a shout out to uh, uh, Michael Maxwell. Um, he is a guy that I'm mentoring, and he's interning with my uh, practice right now. And um, today's message is brought to you by him and by me. And, and the way you can remember uh, Michael Maxwell, is his name means uh, maximum wellness, and that's his heart. He wants everyone us to get the maximum of, of wellness, and the wellness comes from being like God and being a pure reflection of his will. And that's what his first name means. So that's his calling in life to help people um, get the maximum wellness by being an image and reflection of God. So from that, um, I want to begin today's message and, um, and, and just to share my heart on what's going on. And today I'm going to the court of law to face the man who abused my client and close friend verbally, emotionally for many decades. And eventually it became physically abusive. And out of love, hope, and fear, she stayed with him. But eventually the abuse became so physical that she had to leave. And out of fear for her life, she escaped leaving most of her physical possessions. And today we're going to go fight to gain many of them back. But when she left, she left part of her identity. And I've, I vividly remember that day when she left. She cried out, Dustin. Are you ashamed of me? Are you ashamed because I'm giving up on my marriage? And so with that conflict going on today, got put on my heart to talk about our identity. Uh, out of our identity flows our being. You know, how, um, and, and just to give you an example, I, I know that I'm not the only one who's experienced this, and you probably even experienced this week, that someone hurt you or someone that you love was hurt in a hurtful way by someone who was hurting. And someone maybe close to you, maybe someone who's far away, and, and, and whether they hurt you because of their tone of voice, their attitude, or their words, or nonverbal, nonetheless, it hurt. So I know I'm not the only person that's caused others around me to hurt because of my actions. And whether it was intentional or not, I hurt people and I didn't mean to, but I was hurting. So I hurt people. So, you know, we all have it on both sides of the spectrum. But the question I ask you is why? Why is it that there's some people who are just happier than others? Why is it that when you see that person, it's like they have nothing good to say and you try to go the other way? Why is that? Why do we live our life out of our identity? Well, we do. We live our life out of the identity of who we believe we are and whose we believe we belong to. You see, unloving people, unloved people. Hurting people, they hurt people. Messed up people, they mess up people. Versus loving people, love people. Healing people, heal people. Forgiving people, forgive people. So what's the difference? How do you shift from being one to the other? You do this by encountering God's love and allowing God's love to fill us. And when we feel God's love flowing through us, we can pour it into the lives of others by allowing God's love to be our source of love and identity. So by the end of this message, I want you to learn what it means to love yourself biblically, to receive God's love through your thoughts, listening to those thoughts, to recognize which ones are from him and receive that love through your thoughts and release those thoughts that aren't from God. I want you to self-evaluate. Are you rooted in God's love as your only source of identity? Are you biblically loving yourself. So God has a plan for you. And those plans require you to have God as your source of love and identity. Going through life, especially as a believer, with all its ups and downs, it's essential that God is your source 
of your love and identity. Do, do, have you ever wondered why God may not have blessed you yet? Why hasn't God provided for you what you believe he needs to provide for you? Why hasn't God answered you yet? Do, do you ever have this conflict in your mind? You might not even speak it out loud, but you're, you're, you feel it in your heart. You're like, why? What God has planned for you requires you to have God as first priority, first place in your life. Remember that the promised land that God wants to give you requires God to be your identity. God has the capacity to give you the desires of your heart that you've been praying about. He has the capacity to give you the money, the, the family, the job, because God is able. But why would God bless you with something that he knows that the same thing you've been asking for will steal your identity, will steal you, will take you away from him? And many times it does. And so many of the times, the things that we're praying for, if we receive it and God is not our source, it will take us away from him. And maybe God hasn't given you the finances that you're praying for because he knows you'll get lost in it the second he does. Maybe God hasn't provided the relationship you know, because he knows your partner will become your identity once you're in that relationship. A lack of God being your source of identity and love causes us to doubt what God's calling us to do. Doubting the calling that God has for you. Never pouring love into the lives of others or being trapped in a false perspective of ourselves. This is what happens. This is what happens when God is in our identity. Sometimes we get too wrapped up in the future that my identity is going to be 10 years of where I am right now. I get consumed with the details of my life, believing that I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to um, change the tra trajectory of my life and, and I'll be anywhere but in the present. And sometimes I even dissociate myself from the present because my mind and my identity are so wrapped up in five years from now, and not in being in the presence of God. Even the joy that I should be having right now, I ignore, or I don't acknowledge because I'm so busy preparing for 15 years from now, or, or what I'm going to be in the future, instead of realizing God wants me to be who I am right now. For the, le for the leader, it, it could be the weight and pressure of trying to keep things going forward, but you're exhausted. And for that person working extra hours, it could be the anger of not being recognized. For that person who feels like they're stuck, it could be the confusion of not knowing where you're going. Wherever the cause may be, we all have something on the inside of us that stops us from embracing the love of God. And when we're not embracing the love of God, we lash out at the people who are closest to us, and even the strangers. And, and when we're not embracing God's love, anyone in the vicinity of you will suffer. And when you're not embracing the love of God, your relationship with God, and who he sees you as well, will slowly drift away. Because whatever your current emotion is, it becomes your I identity. In Matthew 6, verse 33, it says, but seek ye first God's kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first the kingdom, then all things will be given to you. Why does God want you to seek his kingdom first? That word seek in the original Greek also means to desire or require. So God doesn't just want us to seek, but he wants us to desire his kingdom first, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He requires his kingdom to be first. Why? Because God knows that if we make anything other than him as our source of our love and identity, 
it will lead us to destruction and it will distract us from the one trustworthy source. We can get our identity wrapped into so many different things in this world that if we're not desiring God's kingdom first, we can't love ourselves properly, which causes us to slowly destroy and decay all of our relationships around us. When your identity is in jeopardy, oh, excuse me, your identity is in jeopardy if God is not the source and focus of your identity. Uh, this week, uh, I believe it was uh, Darren brought up Philippians 2. If you look at Philippians 2, verses 2 through 8, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you have any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, I mean, he's laying it on here, then make my joy complete by having like-minded, being the, the same love, being the one spirit, the one mind, doing nothing out of selfish ambition, ambition or vain conceit, means talking about don't do it pridefully, yet in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking at your own interests, but at each of the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who in the very, being the very nature of God, did not consider himself equality with God to be something to be used to his advantage, but rather he, rather he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, I meaning he only did what the Father told him to do or say, and being made in the very likeness of a human, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. See, Philippians 2 gives us a blueprint, gives us believers a blueprint to our identity if we're allowing God's love to be the source of our identity and love. Those verses give us like a checklist of what biblical love looks like. Biblical love, it operates in one spirit, one mind, one love. Biblical love is a love that doesn't selfishly love itself, but it values others more than itself. Biblical love operates under the same mindset and acts under the same mindset as Jesus Christ, as he was here on earth. And Jesus only operates in one spirit, one mind, one love, which is his father's love that's in heaven. As you see it in John chapter 5, verse 19, he couldn't do anything unless he saw his father doing it. In, in the world of imagination, he would see his father doing it, and he would then mirror it. So let's let God be our source of the spirit of love. Let God be our one mind. Let God be our love. Let God be our identity. To have biblical love is a state of oneness with God. To have biblical love is to love yourself with the intimacy that God offers and that there's no other rivals that compete for that oneness. It's complete love from his love. So the next time you feel that you're, you feel that identity drifting away to something that isn't focused on God, Remember that where your identity is will also be how you treat others and how you treat yourself. Remember that all things God has for you starts with him and your identity with him. Don't let anything in your life stop you from embracing God's biblical love for you. Everyone is so quick to talk about the state of the world and everything going wrong. But imagine if your local community, if it exercised these godly principles, instead of focusing on all the things going around that are going wrong, they focused on God. Because everyone is so quick to talk about the corruption in the White House or the corruption in their own house. But imagine the impact in our own house if these principles were applied. How much better would our relationships with others and within ourselves be if we allow God to be the first source of our identity and love. And when I think of the greatest commandment of all, it says, love God with basically your whole being. And then it, in Matthew, he says, and the second commandment is like the first commandment, love others as you love yourself. It's a commandment from God. It's not a suggestion. 
it means that in order for you to love others, you got to first love yourself. And the only way you can love yourself is that you receive that love from God. And that comes from loving God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. It, it's about focusing on receiving the thoughts that are from God and releasing the thoughts that are not from God. That's how, you're, that's how God calls us to live our life daily. As Paul put it, pray always, rejoice always, and everything give thanks. Let your gentleness be evident to all. When you're in God's presence, when you are connected with God, the emotions you will always feel are joy, gratitude, and gentleness. The only time you don't feel those emotions is if you're walking away from his will. You're living in rebellion. But when you are living in his presence, even for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. It's taught in Hebrews. There is a joy that happens, even if what you're going through is not joyful. So take the time to listen to the thoughts, to receive the thoughts that are from God, and to release the thoughts that are not. That's how we receive his love. So that's the message God put on Michael and my heart today to share with you guys and to share with my friend who's going through this divorce today. Let not your source of love be on a human, but your source of love be in God and how God sees you. And if you hear any thought that's, that's, that's putting you down, causing shame, causing Unless you're living in rebellion, that's a whole different thing. But if you are for God and not against God, the, the thoughts in your head are going to be uplifting. They're going to be full. The voice will have a tone of voice that is filled with great joy, gentleness, and gratitude. So, and I want to open the door up to you guys. Um, what, what, what thoughts, when you hear this message, what do you think about, you know, uh, Hurting people hurt people. Messed up people mess up people. I mean, that's just fact of life. But loving people love people. What's, what's the Lord speaking into your heart? I'm going to open up the door for you guys to share. If this was your daughter who was abused by a man for 30 years and your identity was based on i'm fighting for this marriage i'm fighting i don't want anybody i don't want to look as a failure can you speak to my client what what is it that you and my my friend what would you want to say to her especially if this was your own daughter And uh, those who are within the um, reach of your words, I think we find strength, find encouragement. I think it's superior to be reminded of who we are in God. And I think um, it's important to, to, to specify uh, that this, I think, is a correct application of identity when identity politics is everywhere. Uh, I mean, I'm talking like my ports are over flooded with everybody talking about themselves and their identity. So I think. It's good to hear a pastor's heart speak about what I think uh, I would support with you to say is true identity. And that identity is not ourselves. Identity is quite the opposite. And I think the more I spend time with God and the closer I am to God and the more I walk with God, I realize how unlike God we are. I think most of the things that you mentioned there uh, describe God's heart, but does not describe our heart. We self flog ourselves. We beat ourselves down. We uh, are quick to be fearful and anxious about everything. We believe those who speak to us and we start believing what hits our ears, which is not the truth at all. Um, and so I think it's really important to highlight that. I think you've done that. I think it's really important to identify what identity really is. And a believer, you, you spelled it out well, should believe what God thinks about them, not what they think about themselves. And I think about the damage that can be done. I don't have a daughter. 
but I do, I do have uh, family members who are victims of terrible abuse, um, sometimes physical, sometimes verbal, sometimes just emotional, uh, withdrawn, shut down, believing lies. And I think I'd like to support what you said with that would be my final remark to be, let's be careful to, to separate truth from falsehood and truth from lies. There are a lot of lies. The lies are that you're over, your time is done, you know, this is the end uh, when it comes to your clients, there is no tomorrow, this is a sheer and total and, and torturous failure and life has come to an end. So I think her being in your hands today and your support in her corner um, is exactly what she needs, encouragement, strength. And don't you know how important it is just to have someone in your corner? You know, being a martial artist and coming from the fight world, everyone knows how important it is to have somebody in your corner. Who's got your back? Who's there with you when the chips are down? Whose voice are you listening to when it's your worst day? This could be a very challenging day. I don't know your clients, but it gets my heart and I will stand with you in the corner to defend and uphold someone who has been terribly treated and I'll pray for a great outcome. Appreciate your words this morning. Thank you, dear. Appreciate you too. Now, Dwight, I know you're traveling, so um, I don't know if you're able to, I know you said today is gonna be a listen only, so I, I respect that. Um, but if there's anything you wanna say, I, I'm opening the door to you. Well, Darren, I appreciate what you said, um, especially um, being the fighter of, of the group. You know, you God has designed you to be a warrior, and that's who he made you to be. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what I love about you. So, um, but yeah, today is going to be a battle. And um, I, I would say the biggest thing I would want her to walk away from is, is that she's walking away from her old identity. And I want her to walk into a new identity of who God says she is. And for her to, anytime she's got this voice in her head of the abuser and that abuser, it is just so amazing how, even though they haven't been together, you can, you can see that fear. You can see that uh, self-destruction that plays on in her head and wants to kill, steal, and destroy everything in her life. Uh, even when he's not around, that abuser is still around. And, um, and so I uh, that's my biggest thing was, you know, for her going forward, I want her to monitor those thoughts and the, it's not from God and from God, it's going to be loving. It's going to be kind. It's going to be gentle. It's going to be first Corinthians 13. It's going to be um, uplifting. It's going to be, um, and it's going to be a view greater than she can even see of herself. Um, and because God wants to take you on an adventure and a journey greater than you can ever accomplish on your own. And, and so that's one of the ways you know it's from him because it's like, oh, that's not in me. That's, I don't have that ability. Yeah, but if you walk with me, he will. And so that's where um, I'm excited for. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a new opportunity, a new beginning. And, and, and you know, she cried to me about, are, are you going to look down at me about me getting divorced? And um so many people are worried about what it will look like if they got a divorce and uh, will God be disappointed in them? Would, would I be disappointed in them? Will I look at them as a failure? And uh, many of the emotional abuse that we have, a lot of it's, it's self-generated. But when it gets physical, when it threatens your life, when that person is is at a point that they are just you know where you can't you you run the risk of losing your life uh nothing is worth that your heavenly father did not put you in a relationship where someone is going to try to kill you or you feel that your life is completely um it, it, at risk it, that is not that is not love that uh, no loving father would ever ever do that to their child. So um, and I, sometimes I see Christians get trapped in a marriage because like I'm trapped because of my oath I made. 
well, maybe that oath wasn't made with God. Maybe that oath really wasn't to God. Maybe it was the God that you were serving during that time, but it wasn't our Heavenly Father because our Heavenly Father would never, ever put you in a situation where the man that you're married with or the woman that you're married with is trying to kill you. So, um, so I, there is nothing wrong with walking away from an abusive relationship. I, that's my personal thoughts on that. I, I believe that's God's thoughts on it, but you know, I, I'm not God, but, but that's just my heart to you guys. I just don't think anybody is called to be in a situation where, uh, but now, granted, <laughs> most of us who've been married long enough, but you know, you could easily say, hey, I'm being emotionally abused. But many times the emotional abuse we suffer is because God is not the source of our love and our identity. We've made that person the source of our love and our identity. And that person, as soon as they, they threaten to take away that love and identity, it's so silly how we are as humans, but we act totally in the direction of that would cause that person to push us away. <laughs> and we're afraid of losing that person. So we, we lash out at them, but we lash out in a way that will actually almost guarantee that we will lose that person. It's just so silly how humans are when our identity and the source of our love is a person versus God. One stable, one is unstable. So that's what I'm going to wrap it up with today. And um, I appreciate you guys. And I just pray. Uh, my prayer is for my friend and client that you go and live life victoriously. And this is not only just for my friend and my client, but for all those who are out there who can hear this message in the future. Uh, even for the guy that's been the abuser. My prayer is that you get your source and identity, not from your wife, not from your girlfriend, not from your possessions, not from your people, your influence, but from God himself. Lord bless you.